Uh, kia ora tēnā koutou. Uh, this is Carl Burrows from Hacker Works. Welcome to Hacker in the Matrix. Why Hacker in the Matrix? Well, Hacker is what we do, it's what we love. Um, and in this particular instance, it's representing the, color, uh, the cultural knowledge that we share when we perform Hacker, our leadership knowledge, um, the knowledge that has been passed down to us. Uh, the Matrix, well, we all remember the movie and Neo navigates his way through different worlds and in doing so he discovers his own life purpose. And I think as Māori, we're really lucky to be able to have um, these taonga tukuiho, these, um, these, this knowledge that has been passed down to us to help us find our own purpose in life and as, as individuals and communities. And this is something that we love sharing, uh, sharing with the world because we, can, we think we can contribute to humanity, um, at the same time, there are issues around protecting our cultural knowledge, and um, this is what we are doing on Hacker in the Matrix, just exploring those issues. And I've got Emily Wano here today. I'm just really pleased to have her on, on uh, with us. I'm going to talk to Emily in a sec, but just before we do, um, as we've done in the past, we do a quick mahi mahi in our, in our language and um, also do a, a short karakia. Um, and the mahi mahi is just to acknowledge you all, just to acknowledge our ancestors and the kaupapa, the reason why we're here. And the mihi mihi just to get us in the right frame of mind to, um, to achieve what we need to achieve today. So tēnā koutou katoa, e wakarongo mai ki tēnei uri o Taranaki e mihi kawana uh, ki a koutou e wakarongo mai nei. Uh, e mihi anō uh, ki ngā mate o te wā, ngā mate e hinga i ngā ki ta kāingara, me ki ko tērā kaumātou o tātou o ngā rua hine, uh, ko Uncle Ray Edwards, e ta koutou ana ki oio, uh, ki... Um, Mate ka, mate ki tāwhiti ka uh, nō tērā iwi anō oki uh, nō ngā tirua nui uh, takotoma i rā. Haere, uh, mate, haere, haere atura. Uh, ka huriki uh, o tātou nei karaki e tēnei wā, ko wakataka te au ki te uri, wakataka te au ki te tonga ki a mā, kina kina ki uta ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakora he te o he huka, he hauhu, ti hei, uh, mauri ora. Uh, ka huriki a koe, uh, ite tua hene, ite rangatira. Uh, really lovely to have Emery Wano here with us here today. Em Emery, um, just want to welcome you to the show, It's uh, to the podcast. Um, Emery has been a good friend of mine for a long time, since we were in our 20s. Um, so it's really lovely to, lovely to have you here. Kia ora. Tēnā koe e te tūngāne, tēnā tata katoa, kua wakapāho uh, mai kia, kia tāua, tēnei pō. Um, yeah, lovely to join you all the way over there in Engarangi and me here in Taranaki. Good point. Hey, I um, just want to say to um, people who are listening, um, you're more than welcome to write in our chat on the side. We've got Bonjour Carl, Bonjour Emily from Renice. Thank you. We'd love to know um, that people are listening and they're engaged. So say something, say hi, um, and tell us where you are at the moment. Um, also, if you have any questions, um, be feel, feel free to ask. Um, just write something in the chat and we'll get Emily to answer for you. But um, the, the reason why I got Emily on the show is because she does this amazing work with WOMAD, um, which we want to talk about. And it's about sharing cultures. So she's the event director for WOMAD, if, I, if I've got it right. Um, and WOMAD goes, I mean, it's all around the world, but once a year it goes to Taranaki in New Plymouth and um, brings artists from all around the world to that point. So we want to get to that. But just... Emily, just um, really interested to hear a little bit, bit more about yourself and where you grew up and, you know, your ties to your culture and who you are and how you ended up in Taranaki. Kia ora. Uh, yeah, kia ora, Carl. Um, so, yeah, with Carl and I go back a long way and sometimes I think we, we still think we're in our 20s. Um, but, yeah, just a little bit about me. So um, I had written my um, pepeha, which is who I am in our language in te reo Māori, um, but I think because there might be a few non-Māori on here, I might say it um, in English and Māori, if I speed it up. Uh, so, i roto i te reo Māori, ko pūtau aki me rangi pau a ku maunga, ko ku tarere me te poho rūtaia a ku marae, ko te upoko rehe me uh, te whanu a rūtaia a ku hapū, Ko te whakatohia me te whānau apanui aku iwi, ko mā tātua te waka. So um, in English, my mountains, I acknowledge my mountains, my, my marae, my house, my um, tribes and my whānau and my canoe. And those are things that really ground us as Māori. So we have a, 
understanding of who we are and where we come from, and they're really important to us in the work that we do. Um, so we always, you will always hear us recite that, and I think that those things guide us in terms of our mahi and the te ao Māori, me te ao Pākehā, those, those, that matrix that we're talking about of joining of those two things. Um, so I'm an East Coast girl, East Coast of the North Island, but currently living on the West Coast. Um, so I grew up in this massive place called Wōpōtiki, um, you know, Small population, really small population, but very big Māori population. Um, one of six uh, being the Pōtiki, the youngest, um, and the bossiest, they tell me. Um, I was lucky that my mother was a fluent native speaker of te reo Māori, of the Māori language, and so were both sets of my grandparents, my maternal and paternal grandparents, who were both na were native speakers. So. I grew up with the language around me. Um, but we were encouraged, like many of my generation, to learn and speak English. Um, and that was a product of the time of my parents going to school where they were beaten for speaking te reo Māori and speaking their language. Um, by by uh, They were attending Catholic schools, many of them. So very much religious schools and they were beaten for speaking their deal. So we grew up very much speaking um, English, but understanding te reo Māori because it was around us. So yeah, that was a, that's a bit about um, me and where I grew up. Kia ora. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, well, just a couple of things. I just, yeah, Rem, just want to acknowledge what you say in terms of how you're connected to your, your maunga and your, um, and your rivers and your ancestors and your, um, and it's just a really good way to, well, it's a way to say who we are and bind people together. And it's something that, um, one of the things that we share over here in, in the UK when we do some of our workshops, because people um, over here, when they introduce themselves, of course, when most people introduce themselves, they'll say their name and maybe they talk about their job and sometimes where they're from. But um, for us, it's a way to sort of connect us back to something a bit more um, solid, the earth and where we come from. Yeah, they ground us. And I think especially if you live away from home like I do, I live in Taranaki. Yeah. Um, and so this is my, my my constant reminder, reconnecting back to my who I am. Yeah. So um, you, tell us about coming to Taranaki and how did that all happen? <laughs> I met a boy. No, I met a man. <laughs> yeah. um, so I've been here almost 30 years now living in Taranaki, um, raised my whanau here. So I've got four four kids, four tamariki and nine grandkids. So they all keep me on my toes. Um, but yeah, we came here and it was about our desire to um, really to follow te reo Māori and be part of a, a renaissance kaupapa of te reo Māori here in Taranaki at that time in the 90s, early 90s. Yeah. So we came here and that's when, of course, when we, we met Carl on that little journey of ours. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible time back then. And, um, and I mean, you sort of, when you spoke about what your mother went through and how she lost her, um, you know, she was beaten for speaking te reo Māori and even though it was around you, it was, it's been difficult for us to hold on to and something that we've had to pursue ourselves. Um, so it sort of gives some sort of background to, to what drives you in terms of um, that period of time in, in our lives. Um, but, yeah, when I think back now, it's, it's, it's very different to how it is now, but... Um, yeah, I just want to talk about what were the, some of the things you were involved in back then that sort of helped you realise what you were trying to achieve? Yeah, uh, so one of the, th you know, even though I grew up with the reo around me, like I, I didn't speak a lot of te reo, um, but in my 20s, late teens, 20s, I started to rediscover um, what te reo was. Um, you know, we always had the tikanga sides of things to guide us, but the real was kind of like, oh, I don't know what they're saying, really. I don't know how to speak it. So in, our, in my 20s, I started to, uh, my early 20s, I went to and joined um, a newly fledged um, wānanga called Te Awanui Arangi, Te Whare Wānanga o Awanui Arangi. So I was one of the first foundation students of that um, 
uh, Māori University back in 1992. We were the first class. And there was, I think there was, started off with 30 of us. Um, and we were the foundation students for that Wānanga. And so that, that and, and then I, and I met Whare, um, Whare Hooker Wano Mai Tāne, and he was on that real journey as well. And so it kind of just all, you know, it, it seemed like, hey, this is the right thing. This is our time. Um, and, yeah, and then we came to, um, the opportunity came to, for us to come to Taranaki um, and amongst Whare's people and we came back to a place called Rangiatia, which was a campus that housed at that time um, Te Pihipihinga Kākano Mai Rangiatia, which was uh, Kura Kaupapa Māori, um, not an official um, funded kura, but it was a Kura Kaupapa Māori. We had Te Kōpai Tamariki, um, a Kōhanga Early Childhood Centre. We had Te Wānanga Māori, Tertiary um, Māori, language Māori studies faculty of um, what was then the Taranaki Polytech and um, then we established out of that Te Huatahi, a kapahaka group. So it was all about generational um, nurturing of of the koanga, of the nest of learning. Um, yeah. So that yeah. encompassed all of those which we were all part of that journey in the early 90s. But just um, remember that it was a really exciting time, and there was the Korimako as well. You know, the Māori radio station yeah. was getting set up, and yeah, we, had, um, yeah. And we all kind of blended. It wasn't like you know, like you worked for the Wānanga, because many of us worked for the Wānanga at the time, with um, or Tanaki Politic. But we were kind of like you did fundraising for the Kura. You did, you just did anything. It was like we were one big Fano. It was one big Kopapa, and we really thrived on that kind of environment. Um, and we basically um, stuck to each other because it was all real Māori. Everyone was speaking Māori. We were all on this learning journey together. Yeah, and that extended into netball and, and touch and rugby and all sorts of things. And I just, it was it was a really, you know, you're right, we were all really tight and on this journey together and we're all in our young, you know, we were 20s and, you know, we had this huge amounts of energy and with people like Tudor Flavel um, and Takawai Murphy and... Koirangi, you know, mihi atu ki te kraua, ko mate mai tērā kraua. Uh, or Tatoa Huirangi Wai, Dr. Huirangi Wai Kiripuru, real yeah. instrumental people that were forging pathways for us in yeah. the real. It was exciting too, and, and um, yeah, I think we felt really motivated um, to make a change and that we were making a change at the time. And, you know, when you look back, um, some amazing things were achieved. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a generation ago now when I, you know, when I look back at it. Uh, so we've all moved on, and I just, um, I don't know. I reflect back, and I think there's there's some there were some um, oh really good times. Yeah, we had some really good times. Um, yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, ground groundbreaking. Yeah. Too. Yeah. When, yeah. When I think of the things that we did back then, you know, we were. You remember when, we, when you say about that? Um, you know, that matrix, that merging of 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 our worlds we were playing sports so we were all speaking te reo we were the only ones speaking te reo amongst yeah. ourselves yeah. um you know so no one else knew what we were saying or who we wanted to pass the ball to or do that um but even going out into the pubs because yes we used to yeah. go to the pubs and the clubs and we were all speaking maori it didn't yeah. matter where we were we yeah. were we were committed to um our reo yeah um in a way um what even though we're, we're operating in two worlds, we had our own little world which we supported each other and, and protected ourselves. And, um, but, and I think one of the slogans at the time that we used, and I remember you saying this quite a bit too, was like, by Māori, for Māori, you know, is, and that we're here to look after ourselves. We've got the skills, we've got the capability. We don't really need anybody else to, to help us. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't really subscribe to that view anymore um but at that time it was really important you know because i don't know it was the only way that we felt that we could get through the difficult times that we had because people weren't happy about who we are who we were no it was almost like um i think the word elitist we you know people were 
who do they think they are walking around everywhere speaking speaking um, Māori and that was from Māori as well as non-Māori so you know there was this oh, latest bunch of people creating their own little dao up there yeah. um, you know noho hau maru mātou <laughs> ki reira yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think it was important to, to get through that time um, that we were there and supporting each other so closely and um, and we had these philosophies that we could do anything for ourselves and we didn't need other people. Um, but it, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to think, because I'm, I'm saying this now because things have changed so much for me and, and, uh, and assume yourself in terms of the world that you work in. Um, and I'm just wondering how that sort of journey happened for you um, in terms of you working in WOMAD now and, um, you know, taking culture yeah. away and sharing with, with others. I think we came away with um, a confidence to, um, it gave us that confidence to step outside the by Māori for Māori um, once we had some, you know, had some real, we had, we felt we had enough and our confidence was high. So from, from my point of view, I felt comfortable to step out um, and even going home to the East Coast with my reel that was had a Taranaki, slightly Taranaki dialect to it at times, I felt comfortable to go home and, and do that. And what happened was then that opened up this whole new world for me because it was like, hey, I don't have to sit no home do in this bubble here that we've created at Rangiatea. I can actually step outside and it's valued. What we've learnt, you know, wow. is actually valued. Yeah. yeah. So that's um, an about, easy yeah. journey. Yeah. Uh, no, it hasn't. But I think that's like you're saying, it's about, I suppose, understanding who we are and going through that journey of really working on that, um, being bold in that, um, sh sharing ourselves with the world, you know, protected by our own to say, this is who we are. And then mm -hmm. when the time is right, we can step out of that little bubble to say, you know, actually, these same qualities of confidence that we've learned in this, in our Rangiatia Fano, can be applied anywhere. Yeah, I think it was that we embodied for, for us in our own way, our te noranga teratanga, so that we could step out and take that with us. And now we're doing that in, the, in both worlds. Yeah. So I remember um, starting Manaya, a haka group over here, and we, there was seven of us, um, and six were Māori, and we had um, Chris, who wasn't Māori, who's Pākehā, from New Zealand, really lovely guy, great at marketing. And, and I just wasn't, you know, I just wasn't happy with it. I just wasn't happy that there was somebody that, that was Parker in our group working with us. Um, and he was there to help um, us progress, you know, here to help market what we do. And um, in my mind at the time, I was going, hey, we can do this. We don't need anybody else to help us, you know, get ahead where we want to go. Um, and that was a really important co-papa for me at, at that time. Um, it's not now. I mean, I think how I view things now is, I need as much help as I can get, you know, and whoever's yeah, open to this yeah. co and sharing and and promoting what we do, because I believe in this co is not just for us as Māori, but for the whole world, um, you know, it, that's what we need to, or I need help and, and people on board to support what, our co -papa. Um, Tell us about, I just want to say before we go on, um, there's just Mark has said hi to us. My dad from um, Kapiti says hi, Carl and Emery, Morena from Jackie, in London, um, in the UK, oh, and wow. Jerry, um, Fire Jerry, um, who you probably met, our kuya, one of our kuya over here. Uh, oh. So, kei tamuhi atu ki o koutou, and um, just want to say, Emere, um, how, I mean, you've been over here to London, and you met some of our London uh, Ngāti Rāna na whānau. Um, just tell us a bit more about the journey and you getting into WOMAD and how that all happened. Yeah, so here in Taranaki, I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't think it would have happened in the East Coast, um, but because I was here um, and Taranaki, you know, there's not, it was at the time in the 90s, we're talking about the, the mid 90s when we were still on our Tenoranga Teratanga journey. Um, I remember going to what was um, an arts festival. And, you know, we didn't really go to arts festivals. We were like, um, Aotea traditional Māori performing arts, kapahaka comps, you know, that was about us. We didn't really go to arts things. Um, and I remember going to an arts festival show and it was Ngāti Rangi Wewehi who had just won um, Adam Pass, I think it was called back then. 
and I and I was like, wow, we've got the Matatini, you know, the Matatini of the time, the champs here in, in New Plymouth. We're going to go down and watch. And it was on a stage in the, on the grass with nothing else. And I was shocked to think that they, um, here was the pinnacle of our performing arts, um, you know, oh, and they had them on what I thought was a substandard space, didn't really on, give them justice or honour them in the way I, I thought it should have been done. Yeah. Um, and so that was my first foray into that. And so I went and had a word to um, the festival director at the time. So Trotted Fuddy and I went along and um, it was a Pākehā fella, uh, Roger King, who um, was the most gracious and, and open person to who the heck these people are, you know. Um, and we just challenged him about that and said, oh, you know, don't you realise who these people are and what this um, art form is? It's really important to us. You know, we kind of feel like it could have been done better. And um, so Roger and his um, 2IC, David Inns, another really strong, um, iconic person in the uh, arts and festival environment here in Aotearoa, um, they said, OK, then, come and show us how it's done. And we've never done anything kind of like that. You know, we've done haka and kapa haka and organised things, but not at that level. And we kind of went, OK, okay then, we will. <laughs> so we didn't quite know what was involved. And um, so that was in, I think that was in 19, maybe 1995 back then. And that was our foray into um, the arts and, and that the non-Māori arts environment, arts festivals. And then that just continued, um, you know, that was every two years, the arts festival. And so slowly we, we got elect to do a few more things and produce shows. Um, so we had kapahaka shows, we had Māori music shows, you know, they were like, okay, here, here's some budget, go and find some artists and find some visual artists and do these things. And they allowed us that freedom um, well, to go well. off and explore and do that. And that's how it kind of grew uh, into, so that was back in the 90s. And then uh, in 2003, 2002, the, so that was the Taranaki Arts Festival Trust. They then put their hand up. Um, to uh, look at being a presenter or producer, hold the license for um, the presentation of WOMAD New Zealand. So that was way back in 2003. And of course, we were on the inside because we were with the Taranaki Arts Festival Trust at that time. Um, so we, you know, morphed over to what was then WOMAD and none of us knew what the heck WOMAD was back in 2003. You know, what is world? And dance. What is world music? We didn't have it. Nobody knew. It was brand new um, to us and certainly to New Zealand at the time. So that was 2003. Yeah, and then we just got the same thing happened. Oh, go off and, and do this and do that. And, um, you know, we want a Māori presence. You tell us what that looks like for WOMAD. And we're like, okay, and off we trotted. Yeah. Um, at what point, um, you know, you people engaging you to do these um, public festivals. So we're moving out of this, our little, our, our Tao Māori that were, you know, so engaged in that time. Um, is there a point that you realise, hey, um, Māori kapahaka is not just, has an appeal, not just for our own, um, which I presume was part of the kaupapa, getting our own to attend these things, but also other people are coming along to watch and other people like Pākehā are starting to enjoy watching kapahaka. Was there a point where you, where you realised that as well? So I think the first point, going back to your first point, was um, Māori didn't go to arts festivals. They didn't go into theatres and opera house, you know, in Taranaki anyway. And so that was the first challenge was that the, um, Roger and David said, how can we um, get Māori engaged in the festival? One is audience, two is artists presenting work. And then also the, the third point was, and also expose non-Māori to um, these art forms and these experiences. Yeah, I'm so, just yeah. going back to the former point. I remember um, I was on the board with Te and um, they were somebody was looking for some support or funding. It was I'm not sure if it was the same 
um, thing um, in Taranaki. It was a public event. And I remember saying no because it was the for that very reason that Māori don't attend these things. So I mean, it's, short, it's short-sighted now when I look back at that decision. But, you know, it was like, um, we're not going to support this because Māori don't attend these things, you know. Um, but it, it's yeah, not. Time has changed, hasn't it? The environment's yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah, the landscape's yeah. changed. Yeah. Well, tell us about WOMAD then. So you, you were saying that, you know, we didn't, no one really knew what WOMAD was or world music was in Aotearoa back at that time, but yeah, it's moved on as well. Yeah, so um, again, like in 2002, we didn't know what it was. And so um, the Tanaki Arts Festival was a biennial festival, biennial festival. And um, they thought, oh, we'll just tack this, we'll add this festival called WOMAD um, well, this concert called WOMAD onto the end of a two-week um, arts festival. So it was the last weekend of a two-week arts festival. It just about killed us. No, because we'd done two week, two, you know, every day for two weeks of arts yeah. festival. And then suddenly we had like 5,000 people, which was a big deal back in 03, 5,000 people in the bowl for this um, three-day music concert, we thought. And it just about killed us. We were so knackered um, because back then we had a really small team, lean team, and we were doing everything. And um, I remember uh, Roger start coming to us and saying, we got no um, Māori kai at the festival. You need to go and find us a Māori kai um, stall. And so we were like, oh, shoot, you know. And I said, what kind of Māori kai? He goes, anything but hanging, we need hangies, you know. So we trotted off to our kapahaka group to Huatahi and we said, right, we need someone to do hangies, we need someone to do ball ups, we need someone to do fried bread. So on top of that, Fari and I were in the organisation and then we had to coordinate with the haka group to do a Māori kai stall for three days. And so we were carting all this food from Rangiate and doing the hangi and then bringing it into site. And it was just mad. It was completely mad. But the appetite not just for the kite but the appetite for what it was was just astronomical we couldn't believe it you know it was like oh look at all these look at all these non-maoris all these figures they so want to see maori culture they are maori you know yeah. and they want to taste it so yeah that was our eye opener so uh, what about, I just want to say morena to Kiwi Roa. Um, Kiwi, Kiwi Roa is based in, or just down the road from me here in Wimbledon, here in London. Uh, oh, so, uh, tell us about the concept of WOMAD, um, the groups that come over, yeah. how does it fit in with Māori culture, how to, you know, how do you bring people together, sharing cultures and those sort of ideas? So as, you, so as you can see, I've been with the organisation for a long time, done quite a lot of roles and came through the ranks um, into this point where I'm now the um, festival director for WOMAD. So part of WOMAD is, um, it was set up by Peter Gabriel, you know, and, um, as a musician, and the first festival was in 1982 in um, the UK. So that is still our mothership you know, that's still our, our, our big brother. And they, um, since that time, they've presented about in about 27 countries around the world. Um, some are not, uh, you know, some have been, have been and gone and, and some of us are still going. Um, but it was all about um, exposing international audiences to artists and to experiences and cultures that they wouldn't necessarily um, see or or have opportunity to experience in their own um, backyard, so to speak. So, yeah. you know, like in New Zealand, we never seen a, a West African, you know, band before or a um, fado singer from Portugal. You know, we didn't have those kind of experiences. Yeah. So that's kind of what was what drove Peter Gabriel and his um, people at that time to set up WOMED. And of course, he had the label um, Real World Records. So that was all about alternative music being played on, um, it wasn't being played, actually its similarities to Māori is, is quite important. So world music or alternative music of other cultures was not being played on mainstream or commercial airwaves. 
Um, and so there was no mechanism. He was recording these artists, but no one would pick them up and no yep. one would buy it and play it. So he came up with this concept of, okay, I'm going to create the platform to be able to present these artists so that people can see them, they can hear them, they can experience them and feel them, and then they might buy the music as well. So, you know, he, he had the means and he had the... Um, he had the resources to to enact that and make that happen. So that that's was that was the driver back then, and it still is now. And so, um, you, I mean, how many years you've been running it now, and who are the, some of the people you brought over from overseas to New Zealand? Um, so twenty twenty, we are now annual. So it went from a biannual biannual WOMAT in yeah. two thousand and eight. It went annual here in Taranaki. Um, so 2020 was our 16th festival that we oh. run here in Taranaki. Yeah, so I've been involved since then. Since so how many people, of, I mean, it's a lot more popular than 5,000 people now, yeah? Yeah, so we get about, uh, and we, we're our, it's one good thing about us is our site, the Bowl of Brooklyn's, is a, um, is a natural um, amphitheatre, and so therefore it's got a natural capacity that we can fit. You know, it's not like big flat fields like you have in the UK where you can just get a whole bunch of people into a venue and um, we have a capacity of about 17,000 a day that can fit in there okay. and so we generally with our tickets we sell probably about close to 14 and a half 15,000 um, tickets a day and then we have our, um, our artists our staff our volunteers you know um, they're another, say, 2,000, 2,500 people. So we, we get close to 17,500 a day going through the site for three days. So how um, do you incorporate Māori culture, kapahaka, or Māori music into the into a world festival like WOMAD? Yeah, so one of the things, again, going back going backwards a bit, when, when it was first um, mooted about coming to Taranaki and Roger and David sat down with Whare and I and said, OK, this has to be special because each WOMAD, no matter where it is in the world, has its own uniqueness about it. And so, of course, the our Māori, Māori culture had to be front and centre of a WOMAD here in Aotearoa. So we looked at how we could do that, and we came up with um, we came up with a couple of uh, key 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 elements that have been re retained right up till now. And one was um, to welcome the artists by having a pōhiri um, at our marae, at one of our marae, so at All Wai Marae in Waitara. Mm -hmm. Um, so each each year we bring the artists over and we have about 150 artists. Um, that, so those are the ones that have, have arrived in time for the pōhiri. We host about 150 artists uh, at all way with a pōhiri and that's a really an opportunity for them to get a little bit of a taste of te ao Māori, to go to a carved whare, you know, and experience that, to mix and mingle with the Māori community, have a hangi, all of those things um, that they wouldn't be able to do at another way, at any other way made around the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I talk to the artists there, they say that they go to many places, many, all over the world, they go to many places, many festivals, and usually, and this is the most memorable occasion for them, for those that have attended a pōhiri. Um, and it resonates with them. And if I go to, say, Waimad UK, and I see an artist who has been to, um, to Waitara, they come up to me and they hug me and they, you know, they're like, oh, kia ora. You know, so they, it, it really stays with them. It's a memory that's embedded with them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, so that's special. I think um, just on that, I mean, that was the reason why we at, here in Manaya, our haka group, was one of the reasons why we were able to perform at Glastonbury, is because Malcolm, who um, you know, and went to Waitara Marae for the Pōwhiri, um, you know, he was so moved by it and wanted to have a, um, a haka group performing at Glastonbury, and, you know, through that relationship with you that we were able to do that, so that's... You know, the impact of that is, you know, has ramifications yeah. for us as well. And it's just, it's been, it's been great. It's been awesome. 
and I think um, you know it gets it, the, it gets undervalued here at home. <laughs> um, right. we go, oh, another poor hoodie, lots of speeches, takes for ages. <laughs> you know, but, um, for those people experience, experiencing it for the first time, it's memorable, and the impact is um, yeah is something that's not that can't be measured. Yeah, so I just let's just talk about that a bit more because I've seen photos of uh, you know these poor footy. I haven't been to one over in Norway, and uh, you know it's an opportunity for people to respond as well and share a bit of themselves. So I've, I've seen musicians on the on the pie, you know, singing, and um, you know, just a, a, there's a level of engagement uh, that I wouldn't expect. And just by bringing different cultures together, there's a different dynamic that's happening um, in poor footy. Yeah, and I think it's the same for our Māori community. They get to see the artists in a different light too and um, have that upfront, close experience with their culture. So we always um, stick to our tikanga, so it's all real Māori in the beginning, and then we open it up into real Pākehā once all of our, um, you know, our um, formalities are done. And then... Um, I, I get up and I speak and then I um, introduce them and invite them to um, speak as well. And we encourage them to speak in their reo, even though, you know, we've, they've just listened to us rattle off into reo Māori, they've got no idea what we're saying. So we're giving the respect back to them and the mana yeah. back to them to share their tonga as well. And, you know, everyone just sits there and they're listening you don't understand a word they're saying, but you don't need to understand. It's a bit like haka. You don't need to understand the gestures and, um, yeah, the gestures really portray what they're talking about. Um, and it's really a good opportunity for them. You know, normally they're up on a stage, so you don't get to see that and you don't get to experience it because it's a show. Yeah. But this is actual a personable experience. And the... The, um, our Māori community, you know, a lot of them, they can't afford the tickets to go. They can't get the, the free ones that are snaffled up by the whānau that we give them to out at the marae. Um, so this is their chance to be able to get a, a taste and a feel for the um, for the artists. And, um, yeah, it's it's wonderful. And then we always say, you know, speak in your reo. You can speak in any reo you like, wahine ma. Tanema, so women, men, it doesn't matter because we've covered off the formalities and all of that. And then we say, and then you must sing. And so, you know, we get these real rich um, interactions happening and engagements. And that actually, you, it brings tears to your eyes, you know, because each one is different and each mm. year is really special. Yeah. No, um, well, that's, that's everything, really. I think what we're trying to encapsulate here, because um, there's a process, there's a ritual, ritualistic process that allows this to happen. You know, it just doesn't happen by um, fluke. You know, there's there's things that we do as Maori which create the space uh, where people are, are a lot more open, feel free to open up who they really are, and I think they f they feel honoured because I think little things like you say about able to speak their language you know it's really saying you are who you are and we respect that and we want you to share that part of who you are you know yeah. um, and, it just, and then being able to sing you know you're giving something from from the heart from the soul i suppose to that moment yeah so, and it's dance you know some of them are not always singers but a yeah. dance is just yeah. as rich and enriching thing as well hey koha mm. to koha mai. yeah and like you say, it's not it's not a performance, you know. It's it's something. It's a exchange of something really special. Uh, yeah. So I mean, these are the things that I think the world needs to have, um, have more of, you know. So that things aren't just shows that we're not just separated from each other, and or one group is performing, one group is watching. That there's there's a real engagement at a really deep and meaningful level, which um, connects people um, and helps people understand each other. So I think it's just a wonderful example of that. So thanks, Em. Yeah, it, it is. It's that I think we've got, uh, you know, these are top, these are entertainment. You know, everything is an entertainment factor. It's a, a ticket. Um, and so it's all about that. It's not, you know, and so this is a wonderful way. We've found a wonderful way that we can give the paying audience that, but we can also um, have this, this tikanga, this cultural exchange happening as well.
Good boy. Um, this is from Lauren. So she says, Kia ora, Carl. have been enjoying listening in when I can on the different whakaari you've been facilitating. Makes me feel connected back to Ngāti Rānana, uh, the London crew, and helps me consider differing perspectives, which is valuable for developing cultural competencies for my mahi and public health. Thanks for that, Lauren. I think Lauren's in um, north of the South Island, to tau ihu at this time. Oh, kia ora. Kia ora, Lauren. <coughs> um, yeah, so I just really want to come back to the the Glastonbury thing because um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's embedded to... in your um in your experiences. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, no, I want to talk about it because you know this is a festival of one hundred thousand people um, over five days. It's one of the most famous festivals in the whole world, um, and it's just this beautiful vibe because um, the 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 founder of the festival has this philosophy. Um, which really, you know, brings people down to earth, and you feel like you can connect with people in a really open way. It's about the environment, caring for the environment, and art and music. And um, it was wonderful for us. We took a crew of sixteen people, sixteen performers, to perform there. Um, there were twenty of us all up, um, and you know, we had uh, our, our own tent um, behind the stage. Um, we, we felt like we were royalty, even though we were still sleeping in the tent and having to use um, those bogs. Um, we, we had to cover our um, too tired with um, <laughs> with um, soil to keep it clean. Um, yeah, it was it was an amazing experience, and it, it, it was because of you um, that we we're able to do that. And I, what I mean by because of you is that because of your connections through and all that hard work that you've done right from you know this whole conversation um, about back in the '90s and then through WOMAD and then people experiencing like Malcolm experiencing mm -hmm. the poor fitty over in Waitara. Um, from where I'm from and um, taking and then bringing that over to the other side of the world and because of that you know you've opened up opportunities for Māori to be able to perform haka in other places and, and so we've performed at WOMAD in the past um, we've performed at uh, uh, Glastonbury the Wilderness Festival here and a whole bunch of smaller festivals in, in Europe um, but also know there no now no there are other haka groups coming over, um, performing in Europe and around the world. So just what are your thoughts on on people being able to share our culture? Um, yeah, well, look, I've people. been at the forefront of some of that stuff, um, and if we don't share it, it could be lost. That's my fakaro. Um, as long as we nurture it, we tiaki it, but it's to be shared. Um, that's that's my my thoughts on that. Um, and, you know, we've been, like, so Fadi and I have done um, the expo, um, taking little haka groups off to the World Expo. Um, we did Aichi in Japan, so we had, tamata, uh, and we did small versions of these big groups, Tamatarai Orehu, Pātea Māori Club, and, uh, gosh, who was the other one? They're going to kill me. Whangara, Whangara Mai Tawhiti. So we did, um, we took though then they did two months stints each in Aichi Japan and that was a, you know again we were working with um, the government to put haka at the centre and forefront of what we do and now that's become a staple um, with the World Expo so we're really really proud of that kind of stuff so you know again that's about sharing and in, when you look at um, on the world stage what makes us unique. What makes us different? Yeah. Our, 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 um, te our Māori, our reo, our tikanga, you know, the, the, we've got that distinct flavour because of who we are. Mm. So um, New Zealand's a long way from everywhere, but still I've seen an increase in groups coming over here um, to the side of the world. So, I mean, there's definitely lots of opportunities. Um, yeah. How do people go about it? Is it just a matter of... Yeah, it's actually quite a lot of work. So we've toured groups as well. So um, we, t you know, I've toured with Te Matarai a couple of times. So they did a European tour of about, I think it was about 11, maybe 11 cities in Europe. And that was hard work because you're talking, the thing with Haka, you know, you said 16 people. You're talking about a sizable group, whereas when we do um, festivals, we're talking about fives. Unless you're a super big group, you know, and a well-known name, you get the tens, the twenties, 
um, the entourage, but otherwise you want to try and keep it small. Mm. But you don't want to compromise that with haka because you lose the effect, the impact and the sound. Um, so it's that tricky balance. So it's not easy because that, that means, okay, we want to take what can we get away with is eight not enough is 10 enough you know if we the more if we've got if we've got putia we'll take more you know but otherwise we have to cut it back but we we kind of go we're not doing less than um not less than eight otherwise it loses its impact and it's it's not as effective and we're doing we're doing it an injustice really if we if we try and make it too small um so yeah we you know it takes um it takes people with connections um so that's why we've helped and we've been involved with a number of um number of people um to help put together tours um of usually done the funding applications i've done you know all sorts of things i've done all the bookings i've done all sorts and just to make it work um but one of the big things and i think this is one of your questions that's coming up is about collaborations so you get a bit more sophisticated at times you know there's the and you you have i guess a suite of things that you might be able to offer somebody so whether it's the um you know we've taken haka group to the formula one in singapore which is huge massive lots of money, flash hotels, um, you know, so they could afford to take a bigger size group where some, the tour to, um, tour to Europe was, uh, I think we took 16 people and that was a lot to trek across Europe in 11 cities. And, you know, you had to think about that um, monarchy as well, not just the performances. So how do people eat? Yeah. How do our people know eat? How you know because they've got to have kai, and and you know as you know when you go to a festival, you only get fees or per diems for the days you're actually performing. Yeah. You don't yeah. get them for the what we call the, the the black days where there's nothing. So, but for us, we have um we have a responsibility to look to monarchy and look after our groups while they're away. So then it's down to, right, you get $5 a meal while you're away and count out all the money and make sure it's down right down to that, you know. So mm. you have to take a lot into account. Some people haven't even got passports, so it's very, very much um, a pastoral care. It's just as much pastoral care um, that's required uh, versus the finding the money, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and pastoral care things, it comes down to huge amounts of organisation and making sure you've got everything prepared in advance, doesn't it? That's where all the work is. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you have to have, you know, and we've been lucky that we've, through my mahi, and not just at Waimed, and I've worked for other festivals, so I've met some amazing international people, um, like the Malcolms and... Um, others in Belgium and that who have helped and have said we will help you know and they've they've picked up 16 people arranged for 16 people to have a kai at their whare and a kai at some friends and you know billets and and that's what it takes because that's what we would do so it's that koha to koha mai so if there was a group coming here we would do the same mm. yeah interesting um I think w what I always emphasize with my clients, you know, when we have our little haka kappa group going around, is, um, you know, we need to <clears throat> make sure everybody's looked after. And for most people, that's fine, you know, it's a, it's a given, but for some people, it's not. And, uh, it's, you know, we need to make sure that they're fed well and they're put in, a, you know, decent accommodation and they're, they're picked up because it will make such a huge difference to the performance, you know, if, if people know that they're looked after and they're monarchy, then when they come to perform and give, they'll give so much more of who they are um, when they perform on stage because they know they're loved and looked after. So it's really important. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Mm. Um, well, tell us about collaboration. I mean, are there opportunities for groups to collaborate with, I mean, with other musicians from around the world? And how, how would that work? Yeah, so... Um I think it was maybe when the Commonwealth Games was in Glasgow in uh, 2000, I can't even remember what year that was now, um, but we, uh, you know, the host city or the host country puts in a lot of resource now to build a festival, a cultural festival around big events like whether it's Commonwealth Games or the Olympics or, you know, World Cups, they build these cultural programs around 
um, these events to enrich the experience for everybody and it's, so it's not just about sports. So that year um, I got approached by a friend, a Scottish friend, um, to see if I was interested in co-producing a um, project for the cultural festival in um, Glasgow. And it would be a tripartite um, project with Ab Māori, so I was the New Zealand producer, um, garlic artists, um, which were the Scots, and uh, Aboriginal artists um, from Australia. So Rhoda Roberts, from who is the Indigenous programmer for um, the Sydney Opera House and used to do the Dreaming Festival, she was the producer. So we were all, th all uh, three of us, the Scottish producer Lisa Wittick from Active Events and um, Celtic Connections, in Glasgow, we were, we were three friends, so we knew each other, and so they rang up and said, oh, can we do this? And we went, oh, oh, that sounds like lots of work and lots of money and lots of this and that. We went, why not? Let's have a go. <laughs> so um, we got that off the ground, and we took, um, so we did WOMAD here. We did Sydney Opera House, and then we shot off over to um, uh Scotland and we did the Heb Kelp Festival out in the Outer Hebrides and then we came back and we did um, Glasgow. So we had 22 people on the road for I think it was 12 or 14 days. That's like huge and we had to do everything to itineraries, to um, you know insurance, to um, passports, visas everything so it's it is, it's big and we and we so we wanted to have an impact we wanted this um collaboration to be an impact and so it was we called it the boomerang project so we had moana in the tribe and then we added haka a couple of the haka boys from um haka guys from te Matarai, Yorihu. so they came and joined and again it was all about impact so we had Moana, and who was also known, a known artist, but she had a band too. So we sat down, the three of us as producers. So we spent a lot of time, you know, these things don't just happen by just put, oh, yeah, 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 let's go and do that. That sounds cool, and off we go. We invested a lot of time into planning that as producers. And so that's, you know, you need those people, those people that can actually help put that all together. Then you need the artists because that's the ones who are going to entertain and, and um, you know, put on the show. We're just the ones knitting all this stuff in the background together. So you need all of those. And then we had um, a tech crew that we had to take. Like we had people here in New Zealand. Then we had another crew in, in Australia. But then we had to have a crew on the ground in, with us, travelling with us in um, Scotland. And then we had to have a logistics person. So she would go ahead and she would make sure everything was sorted for us, you know, in our next um, destination, whether that was accommodation, the keys, the check-in times, all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's huge. Yeah. And the marketing promo, press people, we had press a press person in each, each um, country. I mean, that was a big project. And that was, I think we would have, that would have cost us collectively about £300,000. Wow. Okay. All right. So it sounds like, I mean, even though it's happening, it's, it, there is a lot, huge amount of um, work that needs to be done um, that, you know, unless you do it all the time, it's quite difficult to be able to do it as a one-off yeah. thing. It's not like going on a holiday to Europe or anything like that. It's like, it sounds like a huge amount of um, logistics and um, promotion as well. Yeah, I think you do. You need, and you need, it's all, you know, we know this. It's all about relationships. We draw on our, who we know and we, do, we draw on people that know things to be able to get make things happen. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, I'm just aware um, I'm going to be kicked off in a minute. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I can <laughs> talk all night. Um, what, what I wanted to talk about is, um, well, just this idea of intellectual property that, you know, here we are sharing so much of who we are um, some people don't like the fact that that we share, or not so much that we share, but um, when there's an element of collaboration and we say, hey, um, we, we'd like to get you involved, let's say, performing haka. Um, yeah. And, you know, there are 
how do you manage that so it's done in a way which you know continues to maintain the integrity of who we are yeah i think i said this um earlier on like for me because of the environment i work in it's uh, it, it's really it, it's about koha koha atu koha mai you know it's about sharing and and about our our tech but for us it's um i don't mind people using it as long as they've been taught they've been given the right guidance and tutelage um from maori they can't that they haven't just watched a youtube or read a book and suddenly they're masters of it that they've been under the tutelage of somebody so there's someone and they're respectful of that and they acknowledge um you know acknowledge who taught them and that they um that that it's not theirs to own it's theirs they've been given a gift to utilize um for for time for the their time you know um and yeah and that that that's my whakaro on it um but that's the responsibility of me if i give that to somebody and i teach someone it's my responsibility um to keep a keep that in check and to make sure that it's being used um in the right way oh yeah, yeah so when you share it's a matter of um well framing it really making sure people know there are restrictions and they understand the depth of it so that there is an element of respect yeah and i you know i um i think if we want to have this uh, you know except if we want to grow the ambassadors of if we want to grow ambassadors other than ourselves of our our reo and our tikanga i've got no problems with people learning the reo and speaking the reo i'm really proud of non maori taking mm. that journey because that takes that takes guts and that's brave because you're up against you know um the prejudice of others who think well their own um, you yeah. know, why are you speaking that language? But also Māori, who think, yeah. who are you to learn that? You know, yeah. so, yeah. Oh, yeah, so just I just want to wrap up. But coming back from, you know, our original, when we started talking about this and where you're from and how you introduce yourself and then our journey through Rangi Atea and, and how um, staunch we were around these ideas by Māori for Māori and then just from that, you know, being able to take that confidence that we had in being who we are and stepping out onto a stage where you're sharing what we know with the world. I think it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's a really wonderful thing. And um, just want to say thank you. Um, thanks for getting involved, um, coming on the show and sharing your cordial with us today. Um, and yeah, it's been really awesome to catch up with you and hear, hear um, about your journey a bit more. Um, how, what we usually do is um, uh, finish off with a waiata, um, but because I don't usually sing, it's gonna might have to leave it with you, Emery. <laughs> I saw that on the end and thought, oh, you dropped me in there. Yeah, I think, you know, again, that's a part of closure for us. So we better stick to our tikanga where we um, do that. But just, um mahi ana ki a koe kao ki a koutou rā ki te rā pito o Ngāti Rā. Um, you've got what Ngāti Rā has done and Fire Esther, Jessup, you know, to put um, Māori culture at the... At the um, at the forefront there in, in in London has been amazing. You know that's 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 what we need. And Nati Ra, you've embraced non Maori to take in, mm. on board that culture, and that's what it needs for it to survive and thrive. Kio kio um, So cool. I'm going to finish with a just a, a general waiata. I think that. Yeah, I think you know this one, Carl. I think you all know this one. Um, so yeah, through DNA, which talks about blowing all of our, um, you know, cares, um, freeing our minds and to the winds and let them blow away all the um, raru that we might be and all the heaviness we might be carrying from our day. Um, for me, it's like nine o'clock at night, so I'm going to sit down and yeah, chill out for a bit. Noreda uh, tēnā tato katoa, Puriane. E te hau, o raia, e te ua, whiti, whiti ia, e te rā, mai a ke ngā, ko 
ラルラルー。負けれあんな、泣いれ。負けれあんな、泣いれ。ポマリ。プマリ、ティナコト、ティナコエ、イメリング、ヒキアコト、カトエ、ワクロンゴマイキア、キャマウエ、ティネワ、キャパイトポ、ホイパイマリリ、キョレラ。